I love it when things come together. I think everything is working today. It's awesome, I think. I had some real issues uh, last Wednesday. Uh, my stream went out on two locations. It's supposed to go to three. YouTube is my primary, and then I also go to Facebook, and I go to Twitch. So if you're looking for me somewhere else, uh, facebook.com slash JR's Woodshop or Twitch. Uh, I don't know what the address is on Twitch. I think it's JR's Woodshop. Yeah, you can search for JR's Woodshop on Twitch if you're a, a Twitch person, if you'd rather go there. Anyway, I was having issues with the YouTube stream, and I believe I got that worked out. So um, the last thing I want to check here before I dive into anything else is let me just take a peek here, turn the volume up in here. And I believe... There we go. I just needed to make sure that the volume was coming across the stream because um, I don't have my headphones on and that's how I would check my audio levels and stuff. So hopefully everything's cool. Let me know if the audio is too loud, too quiet, whatever. I can make some adjustments along the way. But otherwise, um, yeah, it's Wednesday. Welcome. I hope everybody's doing well. Why does my Facebook not show the current thing. No, there it is. Okay. Um, I hope everybody's doing well and it's a little chilly, a little gloomy here in the shop. I had to uh, grab another propane tank from, uh, <laughs> I borrowed it from my barbecue because I didn't run out and fill the other one. But um, yeah, I've got a, uh, a propane forced air heater that I use in my shop on cold mornings because it's usually... I want to say probably between 40 and 50 degrees out here on a cold day when I come out and to get things fired up. And so I typically, I've got a Dynaglow Pro uh, forced air propane heater and uh, it, it's hooked up to a, uh, a 20, I what do they call it, 20 pound tank, I guess is what that is, of a propane. Basically the same one you'd have in a, uh, like a outdoor barbecue. And I have that hooked up. There's a regulator that hooks up to it. And I've got a pressure gauge and such. Anyway, I ran out of propane on the tank I use in the shop on Wednesday, on Monday. Today's Wednesday. On Monday. And so it was a little chilly in the shop. Uh, I didn't get it quite heated up. It only ran for about 10 minutes. So not great. Um, today I borrowed the tank and crank it up. So I got it up to about 72, 73 degrees. And of course, I turn it off for the show because it's it's really, it's loud. I mean, I'm not going to, there's no way around it. It's just loud. It's kind of like having a, a jet taking off in your garage. So I typically turn it on and I also don't stay in here while it's going because it's a little fumey. And even though I don't know, I don't think there's any risk of carbon monoxide in here um, because I crack the door when I'm going and I don't stay in here while it's running. I usually leave it on, let the room heat up. I peek in periodically just to make sure nothing's melting or anything. But uh, then when I get ready to come out to the shop, I'll turn it off. And then I have a little electric heater that I put on in the corner. Uh, um, it's pretty, pretty quiet and it does an okay job. Um, it's not going to, if I left that on to heat the shop up, it would take about four hours. So <laughs> it's not really practical. Um, but I do, uh, I do like having the shop brought up to some temp and then I turn it off and then it, it starts to cool down, but that's okay because it starts at a decent temperature. So I, I, I kind of like not freezing to death. It was really nice last week. We had really warm weather. So the shop was actually not needing to be heated as much. And that was really fun. So I am looking forward to some warmer temps. Um, the, my garage is on the, um, the southern face of my, so like, uh, it's on, yeah, so my house is kind of situated um, where the front faces south, the back faces north, and the sun pretty much travels across the back of the house. And so the garage is usually the last thing to heat up. Now in the summertime, that's actually not bad because it doesn't get sweltering hot in my garage unless it's like 95 degrees outside and there's just everything's hot. But typically it stays cooler in the summer, which I do dig that. But even uh, moving into spring, even if we're having days in the 70s and it warms up nicely outside from the sun, the garage still kind of stays chilly. It's not insulated. It has concrete floors and it just kind of holds. It's like a big freezer almost. It just holds the cold uh, or a big ice chest or something like that. So I use the heater. Um, I bought it this year. I didn't have one last year and I would have like two or three electric heaters and those things just 
they just don't cut it. If I was going to do one, I'd get a big giant one, stick it in the corner up there and have it run to like some 220 and, you know, but I didn't win the lottery this week, so that's not happening. Um, I did win the, uh, the COVID payout lottery today. I, I did see that came in, so that's nice. Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to go to. Uh, probably fixing some stuff around the house or, you know, throw it in the bank and save it for later. I'm a retired guy, so income is pretty much steady uh, unless I do something to generate more. You know, it is what it is. Uh, let's see, what do we got going on today? Wednesday, for those of you who are with me or watched, I started out to, I did a couple different things. I showed off some drawers that I made for a, uh, for a toy sewing machine table, which are reproducing these. Um, this is very old. I'm not sure how old this is. Probably early, I'd say early 1900s, kind of dated. And I, uh, I started doing some staining on my knockdown table. So you can see this is a piece that I just stained uh, last Wednesday. And I was getting ready to do all of the pieces. And as I got through this piece right here, I noticed that, I, I don't know how it happened, but for whatever reason, I had started sanding one side. And I don't know if I went to go flip the board around and I accidentally flipped it over like this and finished sanded this side but I did not finish my finish sanding on the, on the sides of this. So it was nice in the middle and it was not finished sanded on the side. And because it's a light wood, it's, sometimes it's hard to tell um, about the finish sanding. And even though I probably it was sanded to 150, which is not a bad grit to, for a finish sand. I mean, a lot of people will take their stuff to 150 before they stain. I usually go up to at least 220 on mine and the problem I had was that I was getting pigtail swirls on the edges here. When I laid the stain down, you can really see it in the, in the darker wood. Uh, and if you don't know what pigtail swirls are, I use a, uh, a random orbital sander, which is this thing right here. And it doesn't just go in, it doesn't just go in a nice circle. It actually oscillates as it's going. So it's kind of tries to create a more random sanding pattern, which usually is smoother. But if you're using, if you stop at a coarser grit, what you get are these little pigtail swirls and there's scratches in the wood itself. And like I said, it's, it's hard to see on, on naked wood, but as soon as you lay down a dark stain, they jump out at you like you drew them in with a magic marker. I mean, they are ugly. So I decided to stop where I was, get all of the rest of my pieces of wood out, and do a complete re-sanding on the remainder. I, this one is already done, and I was like, you know what, I, I'm, I'm good with this one, it looks fine, but this one right here, uh, and you can see in the, maybe you can see in the slots here, um, so you can see in the slots here, it's already stained dark right in here. I mean, it's, it's dark in there, and I don't care about that. that, this is the part right here that actually slides onto another piece of wood. So whether this is stained and looks pretty or not, I don't care. I mean, I do care that it's stained, but I don't care if it's finish sanded, but the rest of the wood needed to be finish sanded. So I took all of the pieces to the table and brought them back over to the workbench, got the sander out, and basically went from, I think I started at 150, then I went up to 220 and I did all that with the orbital sander. And once I was done with that, I take a brush and I cl clean them all off because uh, if you don't do that, you probably should um, just to get the wood out of any, any dust out of the grain. It lets you feel it. If you don't, it kind of gets, all the dust gets compacted in there. So I always take a brush, kind of a stiff brush. Um, I've got that one, I've got this one right here. So I use a stiff brush and I brush along with the grain just to get any compacted sawdust out. And then I can actually tell how smooth this is. It's hard to tell if you still have dust in the, uh, in the grain. But once I get that out, it feels really great. And then I took just a, a sanding pad. I've got these little, these little mice sanding pads right here. They're just little foam. They're kind of flat, but they've got a little bit of give to them. And I like these. And I just used the standard circular um, sewing machine stuff. Usually it's leftovers, but I took a fresh uh, 320 grit 
And then I take this and I go along the grain. I go with the grain just to get any final scratches out from that 220. And that's kind of my prep. Um, it's more sanding than I like to do, but it's hard to argue with the finish when, it, when it's done. Um, the only problem with that sometimes is the, uh, sometimes if you sand it so fine, it won't accept grain. It depends on the wood. So it, you may not get as dark a color if you're doing really um, uh, a dark stain. Hang on, pardon me. I've got a, a ding here. And uh, wife alert. <clears throat> and so anyway, uh, I, but for the cherry, I don't have any issues with the cherry. I can take it to 320. And like I said, usually it's not a really heavy duty sand. It's just enough to really kind of try to knock down the, uh, any, any remaining scratch marks from that 220. When 220 is pretty fine. Uh, I could definitely stop it at 220, but I just, you know, just for, just because I was really crushed with that pigtail thing and I'd already started, I said, you know, let me just go ahead and just make sure. So I went and took all the pieces. There's two boards per leg. There's two legs, so that's four boards. There's two cross members. I only did the one cross member. And then there's two pieces for the tabletop, and these are all hinged. So I'd taken all the hinges off. The, uh, I put all the hardware and a little... Tupperware container thingy here, um, which by the way, if you have an Ikea, I got a set of these things in all different sizes for like two bucks, and they're awesome to keep in the shop. Um, I'm sure you can get them elsewhere, dollar store, things like that, but if you don't have any, keep, keep some of these like Tupperware container things in your shop. Uh, if nothing else, then for keeping um, hardware and such, if you're disassembling things, um, that, and I also have some of those magnetic dish trays. You can get them in Harbor Freight for like a couple of bucks a piece. And those are, those are pretty nice to have too. I actually have one on the end of my, uh, table saw over here and uh, I'll throw bits and stuff in there that I'm using on the table over here. If I'm taking it off and like I'll, the collet that I have for there, I throw them in there and they stay put in the little magnetic tray. But anyway, big segue. Uh, yeah, so that was one thing that I did this weekend, or not this weekend, but uh, yesterday was to redo the finish sanding on these. So really I want it to be super smooth. And it, they all turned out really nice. They're all, I mean, these are like glass, they're buttery nice. That, the 320, you really don't need to go up higher than that. It's, that's, that's plenty. Um, one thing I wanted to show, I was talking a bit about stain, and especially stain on woods like cherry and such and they can be a little blotchy. This actually has a little bit of blotchiness to it, and, but because it's a dark stain, you don't notice the blotch quite as much, and that's why I can get away with it on cherry. A lot of people, like I said, will use a, a pre-stain conditioner on their pieces of wood, and that literally soaks into the grain, and it fills in open pieces. See, this has some areas that are more open pore and some that are more uh, closed pore on the grain and what happens is when you put a stain on there, the stuff that is more open pour soaks in more stain. And that just creates a darker area than the areas around it that are not as open pour. And that's called blotchiness. It just doesn't get an even stain. Um, but because I use such a dark stain, cherry is one of those that can be somewhat blotchy, but the dark stain really, it, you don't notice it on here. So because I do go so dark with these, you don't notice if this was more of a, an oak color or something, you'd probably notice the blotchiness a bit more. Uh, the other thing I was talking about was the difference between applying stain to end grain as opposed to long grain or face grain. End grain typically is soaks up a lot more um, of the, uh, a lot more of the stain. So let me just to give you an example, if you can see this. So this is all end grain right here. It's nice and flat, long, it goes with the grain. But as soon as this angle cut goes down, this is exposing all of this is now end grain. And now if you can see, there you go, that kind of shows you how much darker this section right here is as opposed to this section or this section over here. All of this is straight grain, so the stain does not penetrate as deeply in the straight flat grain. Once you start getting that open grain, the the stain just sucks in there and becomes much darker. Uh, one way you can combat this is to, a lot of people will take their sanding up 
at least one grit higher than what they've done on the flat surface. So maybe if I did this at uh, 220, I might do this at 320 um, or 400 or something like that. And, and really what you're trying to do is sand that so flat that you're basically closing off the openness of the grain to keep that stain from going in there. Uh, this is underneath in the underside of the table. I don't really care about that. And on the ends here, it's gonna do the same thing. It's gonna be a little darker here. Um, but that's end grain. I mean, there's not, like I said, all you can do is, is sand the, the bejesus out of it and hope that you get it sanded enough that it takes about an equal amount of stain as the, the front. But those are all kind of things that are all trial and error. And like I said, different wood does different things. So it's really hard to kind of tell. <clears throat> all right, that is this project. I'm uh, not gonna stain the rest of these on camera. I'll probably do these either this afternoon or possibly tomorrow um, and get these all finished and then let, let them dry. Now, this one's actually dry. This stain is actually really nice. It's, uh, what am I using right now? This is the Rust-Oleum stain right here. Um, so it's Rust-Oleum. It's a, uh, it, they're 3X fast stuff, but it works really well. They say it dries in an hour. Um, I'm not gonna argue with that. It's pretty good. It covers pretty well. I do not ever see the need to do more than one coat of this stuff. Um, this is Rust-Oleum. I also have Varathane, which I believe all of these are from the same company. I believe they're, both of those are owned by Rust-Oleum. Uh, they just have different brand names. So if you have a, if you have a brand name preference, you're still getting the same product. In fact, I actually have, I'm gonna set these over here for a second. Let me grab this. <laughs> so I have a can of the Varathane in the same color. It's this Kona color and they're, let me get over here. So they're both the same color. They're both Kona. Uh, this one's Varathane. You can see also the 3X faster, res beautiful results type stuff. And if you look on the back, right here and right here, Rust-Oleum, Rust-Oleum. So <laughs> if you're like, oh, I like Varathane a lot better than I like Rust-Oleum or whatever, you're, you basically are buying the exact same thing. Um, same company, same ingredients, same stuff. It's just one's branded Varathane and one's branded Rust-Oleum. I'm sure at one point in time they were different companies. Now they are both the same company. Let me put these over here. They are both the same company and they, uh, and they both make a good product. Uh, like I said, this, the, the uh, piece I just showed you was one coat of stain on that cherry and you can see how dark it was. It's, it does a beautiful job of coverage and it gives me, the thing I like about the Kona on the cherry is, you know, cherry being a little bit more of a, a it's very kind of a blonde yellowish tone to it. Now, as you leave cherry out, it starts to darken like this, this cherry right here has been exposed to air longer than this cherry. And you can see it oxidizes over time. So the color actually gets darker. So if you kind of prefer that, what I would say is mill up your cherry and then leave it sit out for a month. It will oxidize and start turning darker. And I've got some cherry boards that have been just sitting in the shop that have been milled that are like much darker than this. So cherry will oxidize over time. It just interactions with the, uh, the atmosphere darkens the wood. When you freshly mill it, it comes out to be a much blonder look to it like this. And this is uh, typically how I work with it. And so I find that Kona does a nice job of giving me a dark brown, uh, kind of a vintage sewing machine color, but it lets some of this amber from the wood, the natural wood come through. And let me, let me pausing for one moment here, let me go, uh, grab something off camera real quick to show you what I mean. I actually have a piece of vintage, whoop, pardon me for walking in front. Um, I have a piece of vintage sewing machine wood and I can show you kind of what I mean by the color. So this is an old bent wood top from a uh, sewing machine. I'm gonna be 
putting a new end cap on it that it's you can see it's open-ended and it's not supposed to be so i'm going to put a new end cap on this thing uh, and i will probably make it out of cherry and try to as close as possible match this i'm not great at color matching but i just basically wanted to show you that color let me grab that piece that i have that i already put the stain on also it tends to amber up a little bit more when you put um, like I do a lacquer finish usually, and it does, it gets a little bit more, just a hint amber. It's not as much as like doing shellac. Shellac adds a lot of amber, or it can. Um, but I use lacquer usually. Um, I'll probably actually do like a uh, hand rub poly satin on this just for wear purposes. But anyway, you can see color wise, this is a little lighter, but typically this is the, the color ish in general that I'm going for. Um, and this is dusty, dirty, and whatever. It's got pieces of wood falling out of it and stuff. But this is generally the tone that I'm going for. And it has a little bit of amber to it, but it's this kind of rich brown and, pardon me, I'm walking in front again. But anyway, uh, I have a lot of reference sewing machine tables that I can pull from. My wife uh, collects and restores old machines, so I have a lot of them that I can work with and look at in terms of their color. And uh, this is pretty much the color I've come up with. It's hard for you to see on camera. I really wish you could see and get an idea. That's, that's close. So you can sort of get an idea. It's not as dark as it looks in the other camera, um, but it has some of this amber coming through, and that's generally what I'm going for. And that's why I like that Kona. On cherry, it looks too dark on other pieces of wood, but on the cherry, just the way that the, uh, just the way that the wood color is, it kind of comes through that stain a little bit. Um, but that's also why I don't use a pre-stain conditioner. If you do, what happens is it does keep the stain more even across the wood so that you don't get as much blotchiness, but it does not get as dark as it normally would without that. So big reason why I don't use the pre-stain conditioners is that it, <coughs> excuse me, it's hard to get that level of darkness on a piece of wood. Uh, and I know that's kind of the thing that I chase a lot when I'm doing my projects, especially trying to do things for vintage sewing machines and such is not using finishes that look new or colors that look new. I'm trying to match that old vintage, vintage aesthetic, which is mid 1800s up to basically mid 1900s. And uh, yeah. All right. Let me just, Hey, Mike Munn, my brother-in-law's on. Hey, Michael, how you doing? Uh, that was cherry that I was looking at, I believe. So, <laughs> oh, you know what? I could use some more light in my shop. Thank you for reminding me. I try to prep. But there we go. How's that? More light, more better. Um, yeah, so that's all cherry. Speaking of cherry, uh, that is my project for today. Um, actually, before I get into that, talk about one thing that I did last Wednesday when I was staining. I was talking about uh, using like oil-based um, materials for staining. And I always said that I, I lay my rags out and let them dry. This one's dry now. Um, it was, uh, I just lay them out on my floor. Uh, it's a concrete floor, it doesn't hurt. I try not to get stain on the floor. My floor's a mess anyway, it doesn't matter. But I, I lay these out flat to let them dry. And the reason being is that uh, you risk spontaneous combustion. If you wad your oily rags up and throw them in like your garbage can, you can risk spontaneous combustion. Uh, a buddy of mine, let me find his comment because it was really good. He is a woodworker, but he also has years of, um, of hazardous materials experience. And one of the things he said was, well, actually, I will do it from memory. Um, if you're using uh, plant-based things, uh, boiled linseed oil, uh, tincture, things like that, they definitely can combust. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, other oil materials will not necessarily, but you can also put them in an empty paint can, seal them up, throw them away that way. Uh, I just prefer to leave them laying out 
until they dry. So thanks for the uh, for the tip there, Charlie, about the uh, the plant based oils or the natural oils. Like animal, it was animal and plant based oils basically have the ability to combust, and so you want to make sure that you are not. Um, that you're not wadding these things up when you're all done staining. If you're using a, a an oil, like a, if you're using a, a like a tongue oil or a boiled linseed oil, and which I use all the time in my shop, that's what's on my my, my uh, table here. But taking all those rags, boil them, and throw them in the garbage, you do risk potential for fires. So just lay them out. It takes about a day, you know, depending. Lay them out flat. They'll dry. You can toss them away once they're dry. And, uh, or put them in an empty paint can, seal it up, and you can throw them away that way. So thanks for the tip, Charlie. Appreciate that. Like I said, Charlie knows more about hazardous materials than I ever wish to. Um, but he also is a, an avid woodworker. Um, he actually has a really nice set. He's got, he works in his basement, which I think is so awesome. Uh, I, I bumped into him at a woodworking show a couple years ago. And he was, uh, he was looking at... Um, uh, materials for running ducting in his basement for his shop for doing his uh, his dust extraction system and I, I would love to have something like that where I've just got every machine just hooked up to a big giant extractor with filters and but it, it's not gonna happen here but that would be so cool to like, go down in the basement and do woodworking kind of thing um, also I would have to completely soundproof my basement because I can't imagine having like my table saw or my my CNC machine or something running in the basement. It would be extremely loud. So I would have to definitely put sound dampening and stuff in. Um, that's a lot of money for a project that'll probably never happen. But that being said, uh, what are we doing now? Okay, talked about the dirty rag, which I am actually gonna toss in my garbage can right there. So today, um, earlier, on an earlier episode, I had gone through and taken a lot of the scrap material left over from cutting out the table pieces and had milled up these boards and I milled them all at three inches because uh, three inches is the standard height I use for doing my sewing machine bases. Basically they're boxes. And that's the standard width that I use for doing those. Today, um, what I'm going to do is these are already milled up to width and they're already milled to depth. So th that's the beauty of these is they're already three quarters of an inch, which is the, the, the thickness that I work with. Um, but I do have a lot of other boards that I'm going to use and I'm going to go ahead and start chopping up and doing some production stuff to batch out some, uh, some bases. And what I typically will do is look at how much wood I have and then figure out if I'm gonna have two sides, two long sides, two short sides for a, a standard base, right, a standard box. Okay, well, how much wood do I need for that? Uh, typically, if I'm making a, and I have two size boxes that I make uh, in terms of machines. I have a, a standard size machine, which fits a standard vintage Singer sewing machine. And then I have a smaller one that goes for smaller vintage machines. So I have two different sizes, and then within those two sizes, I have two styles. One is just a box that the machine sets in. The other one is the box with a side compartment that's about four inches wide. So a little storage compartment on the side. So what I usually do is measure up how much wood I have and then figure out for the regular boxes, uh, I need two long pieces and two short pieces. This is probably a cutoff that I was using for one of the short pieces. They're typically about eight and one eighth inches long. Uh, the smaller bases don't require as much length. So I try to see how many bases I can get out of the wood that I have available to me. And, you know, doing a little like, okay, I've got, I can get, if I need uh, 21 inches is the longest that I need. And let me grab my tape measure here real quick. So 21 inches is the longest measurement I will need on a piece of wood for doing a, uh, one of my largest base boxes with the side compartment. And this is 20 inches. So this would not work for a long base. These two right here though are long enough 
that I could get a, uh, let's see here. Yeah, these are 26, 27, 27 inches. I can definitely get two long sides for a, uh, a large base with a storage compartment. So this one, probably good. That's large base. These, um, I mean, and the problem is that like you can see, this is slanted down. So this is not usable wood from this side over, not usable wood. This is all my usable wood right here. And that's where I need to figure out how much length do I have. And also, you know, I have to account for the fact that I'm probably gonna trim these edges off a little bit. I mean, these are rough cut and I will precisely cut them. So I usually leave a little bit on each end, but I've got, well, actually this is 21 inches here. Do I have another one that matches this one? Let's see. No. <laughs> Let's see here. And it, this is kind of the puzzle I go through. Like, all right, what can I make with these things? Not gonna work, not gonna work. Maybe this one. And I've got, you can see I've got a little notch in this right here. I put it in front of my shirt so you can see. There's a little, little notch right there. That's not gonna work. Oh, so I'm not gonna get another 21 incher out of here. Nope, that's the only one that gives me 21 inches of full, well, hang on. Nope, these two, okay. These two right here give me 21 inches. There we go. Oops, sorry about that. So these two give me 21 inches. So that's two full size bases with storage compartments that I can make from these two right here. Uh, and I do this a lot with my wood as like I go and look at like, okay, what can I do with the cutoffs on these and stuff? But tw I'll get 21 inches out of both this one and this one. All right. So for those, that means I'm gonna need, it's a storage compartment, which means I've got two sides and then another cross piece in the middle. Uh, so I need three uh, at eight and an eighth inches. So roughly 25 inches, adding a little bit for the, the curve of the blade. So 25 inches, not gonna get 25 inches out of here, but I will get um, probably 16 inches out of these. And I just like to quickly, um, let me grab this one. Just kind of quickly run some lines so I can do some quick figuring here. So I've got a line here on this end, and then I'll measure out to for eight and an eighth, that's 16 and a quarter. So probably should go 17 inches would give me enough right there. 17 inches gives me enough for two. So there's two right there. I need three, so that means I have to go to this board and I'm going to get, let me draw a line on here down the middle just so I can sort of know. There we go. And that way I know that these are broken into pieces here. So I'm going to need, get these out of the way, I'm going to need at least one more eight inch section to complete a full base plus three more. And I don't have, ooh, this is a, yeah. This is a kind of nicked on the edge here, so I have to account for that. Let me draw a line for this one and see how long this is. I can, I can easily get two out of this. Because that is, yeah, that's 20 inches along the long side. So like I said, 16, 17 inches right here, right about here. And these are not my cut lines. This is just for me to look and see where I'm kind of getting my pieces out of here. That gives me my third piece for the one set. Then I've got one here, I'm gonna need two more. Which means I don't have enough wood out of this particular scrap, but this is not my only scrap. And that kind of leads us into where we're going from here, which is to uh, look at um, milling up the rest of my leftover wood. So let me show you what I got here. Walk over and grab it. All righty. These are the leftover pieces from the table legs. And like I said, I started with some very wide wood, uh, about a, it, ranging from like 10 to 11, 11 and a half inches wide. And this piece right here, I'm not sure where this one came off of, but it's already been milled on one inch. This has been jointed right here. And I just need to make sure that it is three inches wide. 
and it is, it's about three and a half. So I will cut about a half an inch off of this piece. I'm gonna lay these over on the table saw for right now. And then I've got these larger pieces. Now these are still uh, rough sawn, just so you can see what I'm talking about. So this is all rough sawn on one edge right here. This is all, um, you know, factory, I won't say factory cut, but uh, lumber mill cut uh, on a flat edge. And they're both that way. So what I will do with these pieces, and I have three of them, is I will take these over to my jointer. And since they've already been flattened to three quarters of an inch, I will use this flat edge as a reference against my, uh, my jointer uh, and reference this and then run these through the jointer to get a nice 90 degree flat edge here. I will then take that edge and run it through the table saw and start cutting these into three inch pieces. These are, this one's 10 inches. This is, well, 10 and a half. And this is the narrowest of them all. Unfortunately, I don't have anything that's over 12, which means I'll have a lot of leftovers. Um, the other thing I need to think about is when I make one of these bases, I need a lid for that side storage compartment. That side storage compartment lid needs to be, I think it's four and a half inches by seven and three quarter inches. And so I typically, if I'm just using three inch wide boards like these, I, I don't have enough wood width to cover that compartment. I'm short by about, I don't know, uh, an inch and a half to make my, my insert lid for my bases. I, I, I handle it two different ways. I'll mill up a couple pieces like this and then make, you know, cut my, uh, I kind of keep that as my center line for it and then cut the lids out like this. Or because I have these wide boards, I can leave one with enough meat on it to cut out uh, a couple of lids and then mill those down to the right thing. I mean, they're only like a little over a quarter of an inch thick. I, they're not very, they don't need to be very thick. And a lot of times what I'll do is I'll end up um, cutting that down on the bandsaw to the right thickness. But I do need the width. And the width means that I either have to glue two pieces together or leave a space here in this piece of wood or one of these pieces of wood that is wide enough to accommodate for that. And that means that I need to figure out um, again, what is this doing? Crazy thing. I need to figure out again what uh, exactly um, I, I have in the way of wood and how I can make that work. So let's go, let's start with milling the edges of these. That way I'll have a clean edge to measure off of, shall we? So we'll take these over to the jointer. Uh, let's see if I have a jointer cam set up here. I do. So there's my jointer over there. It's my little rigid uh, jointer. And I will joint some clean edges on these. And then we can uh, move on with trimming everything down on the table saw. Let me get these over here. Pardon me, I'm right in front of the camera. And uh, I'll talk about these later. Let me put these over here. All right. Get this out of the way. And so the fence on here is already set to 90 degrees to the flat surface here. Because this is 90 degrees, if I reference that flat surface here, the part that gets cut on the trimmer here is going to give me a nice flat 90 degree edge to whatever is referenced on this side right here. That's the theory behind it. Because these are really short, it's going to be really easy to run these through. I just have to pick the side that I want to use for my reference side. And then run them through. I will let me grab my ears. This is not super loud. It's not a crazy loud machine, but loud enough, you know, protect your ears. Mine are already damaged enough from being around too many things that go boom. I would, and you know, that and too much loud music in my youth. Is there such a thing as too much loud music? Yes, there is. Go to a concert and sit uh, fifth row. Back in the old days, when they had everything going through actual stage speakers and not an, a, a, a PA system. All right, let me go ahead and get this turned on. We'll run this through and get some nice edges to start with.
Okay, so this is uh, basically what I'm looking at. Um, we started with a surface that looked like this, and it's pretty rough. Um, but luckily, these are, these are actually cut very straight, even though it's a very rough sawn. So it doesn't require a whole lot of passes to get those cleaned up. But this is what I'm looking for. Now this runs, hang on a second. Uh, let's see here. So if I take my straight edge and I run that down to here, it's harder to do with this one. But, or if I do it this way, you can see that there's no gap in there. It's very flat on there. Or I could do it this way, run this edge down here. So it's very flat. Oops, there we go. So it is very flat, very square to this side right here. And let's go ahead and get the others done. And then we can use that side that we're milling right now as a reference to run against the fence on the table saw. And then that's how we'll get all of our wood cut to size. All right, I'm just gonna do these two real quick. I'm not gonna take any breaks in between because they're not very, they're not very rough and they're pretty straight so they shouldn't take long. So give me just a minute. Let's try this side for this one. Figure out which way I wanna go. Got ship out right there. Mm, okay, that's good to know. All right, let's do this side. go back over to the other camera because I want to show you something I just found when I was milling this is that uh, let's see here I remember this now about this piece right here when I was cutting this out the this is the way this is cut is basically a, uh, a flat sawn wood and if you if you think about a, uh, a log being milled up right and so you can't really see that, can you? You know what? Hang on, I've got this here. I got this. Here we go. Illustration time. This will work. So flat sawn piece of wood. What that means is that if you take a log and you look at it from the end and they run this through a sawmill, and the different cuts come from the different places where they cut this wood. So as they, if they just come through and they cut it across, that's the most economical way to do it, right? Because they don't have to turn the log any. They just start cutting it into pieces. 
And then the grain obviously is going like this, right? It's a log. So it's running in circles like this. And this determines the type of cut by the, the way the grain is in the wood. So you've got these circles running around these ways right here. So this is the end of a log right here. Let's see if this is any better. There we go. So this is a log right here. When they go to cut it, if they just cut it this way, very economical for them to do, and they get two to three different kinds of wood out of that. Cutting it this way, this is called flat sawn, and it's flat. And what it does is it gives you these cathedral patterns in the wood. Let me see if I can find a nice cathedral pattern here, if you can see it. So this is a cathedral pattern where the wood is basically going up this way. And you get these big, tall things right here. You can also tell from the end grain, let's see if I can find a nice end grain here that will show this. So the end grain on a flat sawn piece of wood is, and I'll, I'll kind of demonstrate this, but it's basically running like this. This is that end grain. This is that grain from the circle right here that you saw on this piece. This is the way this grain is actually running on the end of this board. So right down, somewhere down in here on this board was the center of the piece of wood. This was a pretty large tree. And as the wood starts getting closer to the edge of the tree, these lines start getting more and more from angle to vertical. So they stop going this way to start getting straight up and down. When you actually cut a board out of this section right here, so say you get down to cut one right here, this board that's in this section right here, that grain is almost running straight up and down. That is called quarter sawn. That's much harder to do. You don't get as much quarter sawn stock out of a, a, uh, a tree as you do flat sawn. The quarter sawn is usually very stable. Uh, it's used for things like table legs, uh, guitar necks, uh, things where you want a nice stable piece of wood because those, those uh, uh, grain rings are basically vertically going up and down. There, there's no slanting to them. Um, the slanting can lead to cupping. If you've ever been on an old deck or something, you notice that the boards are kind of bent and cupped. That's usually because that's cheaper wood, it's flat sawn, and over time, the way the wood dries, it kind of tends to curl or curl up. Either way, um, this wood right here does not do that. It would curve, it, it's hard to explain. But anyway, this is very stable wood. It's quarter sawn, it's usually more expensive, but it's also not as pretty because it just has straight grain lines. Uh, the grain running through it, um, here's a piece that kind of has those lines in it, and you can see. So if you see how close together and how straight on this side of the board, these lines are right here. That is getting close to quarter sawn. And the, the uh, it's actually kind of rift sawn. So, but they're, they're running at about an angle like that. So these are almost quarter sawn. And then they start, as they start flattening over, you get into uh, a thing called rift sawn. So on here, these areas right here where it's, you still have straight grain, but it's kind of at an angle. That's rift sawn, and then the straight up and down is quarter sawn. There you go, wood milling 101 for you. If you didn't know, now you do. Okay, so where am I going with that? Well, I'm gonna show you what happened to this board because it was, uh, hello, wake up. Because it was flat sawn on this, I gotta find the board I was using because it has an area on there that, um, here it is. The cathedral pattern on here was very thin. This was right at the edge. It was right at the edge of where that um, that saw went and where the top of this circle was on this cathedral portion. And what it did, I don't know if you can see that, yeah, you can see that. This whole little slab of wood right here just chipped out when I was planing this. So there's a whole little section here that just got chipped out, like a whole lifted out. And that is notably deeper than the wood that surrounds it, which means that this really isn't usable for anything. It's kind of hard to, I'm trying to get a light on there so you can see it. Um, 
but you can, I mean, you can see the area I'm talking about, but you really can't tell the depth of it. It's, it's hard to tell from the camera angle, but it's deep um, where it chipped this one huge cathedral pattern piece of wood out of here. And that being said, I can't use any of this for my bases. But what I can do is figure out how wide this is. And I think, yep. So looking at the width of this, I can get six inches of width of usable wood before it gets into that tear out. I can get six inches on there. Come back here and show you. Six inches on here. And then I can use the rest of this, which is, um, let me just put a mark on here. That's my six inch mark, give or take. And then this will give me almost five inches of wood on this side, which should give me enough I don't need, I can get rid of this. I can get two, um, one, two, at least two compartment lids out of here. So that's how I'm gonna mill this up. I'm gonna take two boards out of the width here. I could do two three inch boards and I'll leave this big section up here and use this for my lids. So the wood basically made the decision for me as how I was gonna mill this one up. Um, yep, and then the other ones are fine. So there's no problem with that. There's no problem. I mean, you can see these got, nice cathedral pattern, which like I said, is to me is really pretty. It's much prettier than just plain straight grain. I, I, I love this patterns that you get, especially cherry is a really beautiful wood like this. Um, and a lot of, like I said, a lot of the wood you'll find is flat sawn. There's some good, you know, typical wood patterns in there. And you can see how they just, the top of the log, they just sheared this right off. And you get these really pretty patterns in here. Um, not always the most stable wood though. So you have to kind of consider when you're making things, do you need more stability or do you need prettier wood grain? So, <sighs> all right, I'm going to get these over to the table saw. We'll set that up and then we will start cutting these down and getting some usable wood. That's step one is getting the width. Then we'll start doing length of the pieces. But anyway, let's go to Cam number three, let me make sure I don't have anything going on here. Uh, okay, and here, okay. All right, just checking. I just wanna make sure there's no comments I need to address. Let me move over to the table saw. These pieces are already milled, so I'm gonna set these aside. And then we can set this up to do our three inch cutting. We're ripping these today. Um, I have a really nice saw blade on here. Uh, saw blades are not something that usually people spend a lot of money on, but I will tell you, if you are serious about your woodworking, um, invest in at least one really good blade for your, for your saw because it just makes all the difference in the world. This is a Ridge Carbide Super Blade. Um, it does a really good job of both ripping and cross cutting. It has two teeth that are beveled, so one goes this way, one goes this way, and then it has a flat blade in between those. So it has three different blade angles, um, pretty decent gullets. Uh, it's about a $100 blade. Uh, you know, it is what it is. You know, tools, tools are expensive at times, but I will tell you that if you buy, instead of just running out to the Home Depot and saying, oh, I need another blade, you know, spend your money on a decent blade. You can also send these back into the company and get them sharpened. They will, um, it is a small fee, but they will, they will resharpen your blades to uh, these carbide bits, get them sharp again, and it'll be just like a brand new saw blade again. All right, I'm going to set my depth here. Uh, I've talked about this before, but uh, there's a lot of discussion in the woodworking community as to where to set your depth for your saw blade when you're running it through. Uh, part of it's a safety thing, and part of it is an effectiveness thing. You know, how effective is it in cutting the wood? Obviously, you want it to go above the, uh, the level of the wood if you're cutting all the way through, if you're ripping. But... What I have found to be the consensus is that I go 
above the surface of the wood by a little over a tooth, like the top tooth here. This is not plugged in, by the way. So just in case you were wondering, we're not plugged in, so I have no fear in touching my blade here. Um, but if you go just above that tooth, the rationale behind that is that the, as the blades move forward, because the blade turns this way, as that blade turns forward, it's applying downward force on the top of the board. I don't know if that's true, but you know what? It kind of makes sense to me. That sounds like it would work that way. And uh, I've had pretty good success doing that. So uh, definitely when you're, when I'm ripping long pieces, I have that up that high and that's been pretty successful to me. Now, obviously you want to keep your fingers out of the way because that blade is running above the wood. I use one of these things, which is a gripper um, made by Microjig. These are awesome. I'm going to get a different one out. I have several of these. This one is set up for wood, but the problem is the three inch cut that I like to take, which I think I'm set at three inches right now. I'm going to go just a hair over three inches. It gives me some sanding width. But anyway, it, it actually would hit that blade as I'm running through, and I don't want that. I have another one. Hang on a second. Off camera again I go. Running over to my drawer to grab my other micro jig here that is set up. for doing just this kind of thing, because it has an auxiliary fence, it's not an easy word, auxiliary, auxiliary fence on it. So you can see the difference between these two. Um, similar, but this has an added fence on the side right here that gives me this much width. I do not have that on this one. I have this one set up differently. But what that means is I can actually offset this from my table saw fence now, and I can find a, uh, an area I can set these blocks here so that they will run right in between that saw blade and not impact it. The other thing I need to do is figure out how high I need to set this part of it. This adds additional stability to the gripper so that it won't tilt off your wood. So this nice flat piece right here just holds it in a very much vertical upright. So now I can run this through. This also has some extra things like it has a, a wood pusher so I can loosen this. It'll drop down and then push the wood through if I wanted to do that, which I do not on this particular one. Anyway, so that's set up. Uh, I need to set my dust collection so that it is collecting from the saw itself. So hook that in. And I need to gather my electrical cord because that's just how I run things. Everything uses a cord and it's always the same cord. Gotta love my small shop. And uh, yeah, I've got my, I do have a little wireless uh, fob that I got for my dust collector. Instead of having to always run over and turn my collector on and come back, I just got a little thing that plugs into the outlet. You plug the uh, vacuum on there and turn it on. And then you can off and on with this little thing. I think it's like 10 bucks on Amazon. It's, it's pretty cheap. Uh, the other thing I need to do really quick is just clear some space at the end of the saw so that the wood that's being cut has a place to go. These are not extremely long pieces, so I don't need to create a whole bunch of space for them. Well, that is the one reason I kind of oriented my table saw this way though, with my uh, workbench. It didn't used to be this way, but at one point in time I was like, you know, if I just put it that way, I can run my long boards on there. I don't have to worry about them falling down. They'll just kind of rest on the table there, so. Uh, the other thing, just to hit on, uh, if any of you have watched my YouTube videos on how I made my, <laughs> my workbench, the most comments I've received is a short section when I was milling these very large southern yellow pine boards. And um, it was a stupid thing I was doing where I did not have a riving knife in the, uh, in the saw. The boards themselves, once they cleared the saw, were starting to pinch back together. I was relieving all that pressure in there and it was just, they were squeezing back together to the point where it would clamp down on the blade and shut my saw down. And I got so many comments like, you should be running a riving knife. Why don't you have a riving knife? Da, da, da. 
and they're not wrong. I should have had, <coughs> excuse me, I should have had the riving knife in there. That being said, the riving knife was not going to help me from keeping my saw from getting shut down because those things were squeezing so tight that it was actually squeezing at the front of the saw blade, not at the rear. Also, those boards weighed about 30 to 40 pounds a piece. So the chance of getting kickback from one of those really stinking heavy boards was next to nothing. Um, that being said, I always run with my riving knife in now. Uh, and that's just this piece of metal that sits directly behind the blade. And it, its whole purpose is to keep wood from pinching together after the cut. The kerf will close down sometimes because you're relieving pressure. There's, there's pressures built up in this wood. And depending, it's, you can't tell before you cut it. But after you cut it, that pressure may relieve to the point where it actually squeezes that wood together. It's trying to push into each other. And you've taken a piece of wood out. Now it's going to squeeze together. That squeezing together can squeeze onto the blade. And if this blade is spinning at many RPMs, it can pick that wood up and shoot it right at you. The riving knife keeps that wood from closing back down on the blade point right there. So that's the whole point of the riving knife. I leave it in all the time now. Um, it sets just below the depth of the saw. And so if I'm doing, if I'm not running the saw completely through, like I'm doing a little notch cut or something, it doesn't impact that area right there. Also, it has some notches in here. There is a, um, there is a protective shroud that goes over this, uh, a finger guard or whatever they want to call it. I, I find it unusable. Um, but you should use one. Absolutely. Please use it. I just don't do as I do, do as I say. Use the finger guard. Anyway, I don't use it, um, but I try to be very careful. I use things like my, my pusher here. Um, the, the other reason I don't like having that guard up there is because it's hard to push your wood through. Now you have to use a thing like a push stick or something because the guard sits up and goes all the way here. So you have to either run a push stick and your hand up here or something like that. I just, I don't like that. I would rather, much rather have something like this that's running over top where I've got all of this plastic between me and that blade and a lot more control over the wood. That's, that's my theory on all this. Take, it, take what you will away from it. Um, do as you will. Like I said, just be safe in your shop. That's, that's all I have to say. Just be safe. Uh, you know, you go in with 10 fingers, come out with 10. That's the best policy. All right, let's go ahead and crank this up. And because of the electrical system in my shop, I have to turn on my saw first and then turn on my dust collector. If I do it the other way, my saw surges power and it'll either pop a fuse or it won't turn on. It's crazy. I have to do things in a crazy little order, but it works. You just figure things out. All right, so there's a new three inch board right there. Nice. I, I went just a hair over three. It's like a 16th or so over. And that way, if I need to um, sand or uh, uh, get the planer out just to level things out, it, it, I've got a little bit of meat to work with there. So let me set this over here. All right, now we're on to the bigger ones. This goes in the scrap bin back here, as you can see it overfloweth. I'm not sure why. Last time I did a, uh, a burn in my barrel, I did not clear that bin out and I should have. But uh, anyway, I'm just trying to see which one of these is squarest against my fence. And it looks like this angle is. Okay. Now I do have, this has a little nick in the grain right here. So something that I have to look at when I'm actually using these for, um, for boards. 
let me let me check this real quick because I'm gonna come back to this one. Let me grab this one right here. Let me grab this one and look at it real quick and see. This one is clean on both sides and both edges look good. So we'll go ahead and build this one up. Okay, these are pretty good. Um, the one thing I will say about cherry is that, first of all, when you're cutting it, you have to keep this wood moving. If you stop or pause for any point in time, you're gonna get burn marks. I, cherry is notorious for this, uh, maple as well. Um, I don't really get these on oak or walnut as much, but um, you can see every time I pause that saw, right here, right here, right here, I can absolutely see every time I pause where that saw burned through. Part of that is because I probably should get this blade resharpened. Um, when it's brand spanking new, you don't usually get that as much, but, um, uh, and it's always on the outboard side of the cut that gets the burn marks, not on the inboard side. So when I, this was my first cut right here, you can see the inside of this board is very clean, but, this is the outside right yeah so this is the matching piece right here so look at all the burn happened on this side so when i ran it through all the burning happened on this side the part that's on this side of the saw does not get that um, so that's always something to consider when you are cutting is if you're going to get burning you know is it burning more on one side of the blade than the other and whatever this i tried to keep this piece moving through as much as i possibly could without stopping I had just one area here where I had to kind of readjust uh, hand position and it did a little burn there. It comes off with sandpaper. I mean, this is why I cut just a hair thicker than what I need because if I end up with stuff like this, I don't want to have to toss out the whole piece because then I have to sand it flatter than my width. So something to consider, you know, just one of those woodworking things that you don't have any choice about. <clears throat> All right. This piece, okay, this is my, uh, I don't really have a choice on this one. This is my crazy piece with the cathedral cut here. Let's go ahead and do, we'll run it this way so I can keep an eye on that cut. Um, and you probably saw I had to readjust this portion uh, as I was cutting that. Uh, when I'm cutting these wide boards, I don't need that extra support because obviously it's wide enough that this can rest right on there. As it moves to a point where it's just that last cut and this is gonna overhang, uh, just to avoid any tipping, I always lower this back down. All right, let's get this one cut and see. Okay, we're cutting on this side. We're gonna leave 
Basically, we're gonna leave this much wood uncut on here. I might get two cuts. Let's check it out. Holy you go. All right, this is that piece that had the, the little chip out on it, or the big chip out on it right here. And I'm gonna stop on this piece. I'm not gonna cut another section out of here. This is all, from this point on, is all good usable wood, so I can hold on to this. And like I said, I could probably make some lids for my uh, storage compartments out of these, and that will be fine. This section, uh, there's just a teeny tiny little edge here, and that's not even worried, I'm gonna cut that off anyway, that was running into that chip out section up here. But the one issue I do have on this board is, uh, not this one, the one I had on this board is that there is a little section right here where it, there's just a little chip out of the wood. It's not very, I mean, it's like maybe a 16th of an inch or so right here on this board. You can see that on there. It's just a little dark section right here. It's about that wide. That's actually not bad because if I pay attention to the way I use my wood, uh, I might end up using this as a side piece, in which case um, I usually mill out um, for the bottoms of my boards. I use quarter inch ply and I use a rabbiting bit to cut a, a rabbit into the bottom of the base to set that plywood into. So if I keep this on the bottom of the side and use this to run the rabbit, it'll completely clean that out. That'll be gone and I won't have to worry about it. So um, once again, just kind of keeping an eye on my wood, what I have and how I want to use it. And if you think ahead just a little bit, um, it, it could save some frustration down the road by just doing a little bit of pre-planning. Um, this one is pretty good all around. I'm gonna get uh, three boards out of this one. Uh, I've got a lot of snipe on these boards. I'll probably lose a couple of inches and that's just planar snipe and there's nothing you can do about that. Um, I've seen $3,000 planers that leave planar snipe and it's just, it's just a curse of using the tool. Uh, and so you just deal with it. You just plan for that extra couple inches you're gonna lose off the end of each board. All right, let me get this one cut down and then we are done making three inch wide boards and then we can move on to figuring out how long we want to cut them.
And I gotta say that even though I had the dust collection running into the bottom of the sand, and it, uh, bottom of the sand, bottom of the saw, and it does an okay job of collecting all the stuff being thrown down into the bottom, um, this thing still throws a bunch of, I mean, I don't know if you can see it, look at that. Um, yeah, it throws a bunch of sawdust into the air um, and all around the table, which is why I'm impressed with people who can run stuff inside their house, like in their basements and stuff. Um, actually, uh, Saw Stop has a really nice over the blade uh, dust collection system on theirs. It's an overarm system that actually comes all the way out and up and over and connects in here and then it connects into your main dust collection port. And from what I've seen, it does a great job of collecting all this stuff that throws out of the top. Because you have to imagine um, the blades are pushing into the wood and they're pulling, you know, they're throwing all that sawdust down, but all these blades are coming up out of that section. So everything that's not necessarily getting pushed up in the gullets gets thrown back at you as these blades advance forward. So like I said, it, it does an okay job, but I still always end up with a lot of sawdust when I'm using my saw. Just is what it is. Um, but, you know, quick run with my hose over this. We'll make short work of that. In fact, let me just do that right now. Okay, that's that. Let me get rid of this scrap here. Put it in the bin. Just about time for another fire. And now we can look at all of the wood we've got. Let's walk back around to the bench here real quick and start checking out our pieces that we've got here and measure those up for additional boxes. I said, the way I like to do this stuff is um, I like to batch things out. Like, you know, looking at this, I, if, if I can make a whole bunch of boards through a three inch cut, that's just one less setup I have to do. If I come back and make one, then I have to go back and do another one and then go back. It's like, I'm gonna cut, if I'm gonna get three inch boards, I'm gonna cut all the three inch boards at once. So I typically like to batch these things. I try to make, um, multiple, uh, multiple bases at once. I don't just usually just do one unless it's like a really special request or if it's a uh, special wood species. Like if someone says, oh, I really want one out of walnut, uh, I'm happy to oblige because I make more money on a walnut one. But on the other hand, it's, um, you know, I, I don't like making all the extra cuts. So if I can batch things out like this, that's how I like to, uh, to work. And if I'm going to cut, you know, I figure out, okay, how many of these am I going to need to be eight and one eighth inches? And I figure that out. I'm going to cut all my eight and one eighth inch blocks at one time. I'm not going to come back and forth and do these. I'm going to do them as economically as possible. That minimizes my time in doing setup and running back and forth and changing machines around. And it also means that I get to, um, I, I get to maximize my profitability. Uh, if uh, it takes me an hour to make one, it takes me an hour and 10 minutes to make three, well, uh, my profit margin just went up. So you, know, it's, you gotta take that in mind. Now, let me go back and get my other boards that I've already done, because we were looking at those and we figured out how many of these we were gonna turn into, let me set this down, how many we were gonna turn into large bases and I had two there, I had two there, which means I needed additional two, right? I had four long bases, or two, pardon me. Here's two long bases. I'm gonna set these over here so that I can keep things straight. This is the other thing is you gotta keep things straight. That means I need three pieces for that one, 
I'm going to need three pieces for that one. This is just two, which means I need an additional two pieces, two eight and a eighth inch pieces, one for each one of these. I'm look at this one. It's one of my shorter boards. Um, I'm just going to arrange these in, in length here as well, so I can kind of take a look at what I've got for lengthwise and try to use the shortest ones I can for uh, using for those shorter pieces. This one is pretty short right here. Um, also, I, let me see if I can show you on here. Uh, yeah, so if you see this line, whoop, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. See this line right here? That is actually where the wood, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, right here, there's a dip right here and it runs flat here and then it gets thicker right here. Well, this is that portion I was telling you about what happens with the planer is it just does this. Typically what I'll end up doing is cutting this section right here off. So any wood measurement I make would go past that point right to there. All right, let me, uh, let me get my ruler here and measure out. Like I said, they're eight and an eighth. I usually figure out a 17 inch piece um, to accommodate for cutting the end of the board off and the end here and then the kerf in the middle. Um, it just gives me enough slop. So I just use a rough estimate of 17 inches and I'm just gonna say eight and a half right there. Right there. So there's my, my marks for this one. And that gives me my three boards for each of my two long bases that I've already cut these blanks for. This extra piece right here is seven inches. That is not necessarily usable for any of these, but let me see. No, see, even on my, even on my smaller ones, those are seven and 11 sixteenths, which if I take an eighth of an inch off here, that's a little over half an inch, and that's not gonna give me enough on this piece. So this will probably just end up being scrap. That being said, I now have, all right, this pile over there is two full bases worth of wood. Now I can look at what I've got here, figure out, okay, well, what else can I make out of this? Uh, I definitely have some longer pieces here. So making 21 inch pieces out of these is no problem at all. Um, actually, I could probably get, ooh, this one I can, might be able to get one side, one full side and a smaller piece right here because this is actually not bad. Um, yeah, all right, let's, let's see, that needs to be cleaned up. I'm gonna measure out 21 inches on here Let's get 21 and figure out what I've got for wood here. Um, I like making the large bases when I can. Um, it's, once again, it's more profitable. I charge more for them. It, it takes more effort on my end, but it, it's also more, pro I charge more for it. And so, you know, a little bit more bang for the buck on me that way. So this actually gets me a long piece and a short piece, which is awesome. So there's one long and one short. I think I can do the same out of this one to get my 21 on here. Like I said, these are rough estimates. I will go back and cut these. I'm gonna cut the end off, get a clean end, and then I'll measure out to the exact length I need and then make another cut. So these are just rough estimates at the moment. Yeah, so this one I can do the same thing. This gives me another side and another edge Another short board, so that's, I need one more short board for this one, so that's not bad. Uh, let's see, I've got, golly, I can make a lot of these. Um, that being said, should I make a lot of them? Do I have enough to make lids? And I probably do. I mean, I've got a lot of scrap like this, and this is, like I said, this is the kind of scrap that I will take and use for um, gluing together. Um, that I've got, well, let me show you. Like I've got a piece of wood, wood like this. This is eh, a little over, it's like two and an eighth inches. If I cut this in half and then glue those together, that's another lid. And I've got a few of these type pieces of wood laying around. Which means 
yeah, let's go ahead and just keep ma making as many long bases with storage compartments as we can. Like I said, those are, those are my most profitable. Those are my most sought after. And, um, you know, why not? If I'm going to make money, let's make some money. You know what I mean? So let's measure out another 21 inches, give or take. And check that. Yep, 21 inches. If I was making without the base uh, or without the storage compartment, I would only need like 16 and a half inches and two sides. So I can be much more economical and get probably more of those. But I don't know, I get about $20 more by adding that <clears throat> three inches on or four inches onto the base. You know, <laughs> to me, that just makes more sense. Um, and people just tend to, I think they just tend to like them better. I, I sell those faster than I do the ones that do not necessarily have that. So 21 inches, I just drew that one. And then we've got um, extra wood down here. Yeah, that's, this is eight inches long and I've got more than that. So this is one right here. Now I'm gonna need one extra short piece for this one, one extra short piece for the one I'm doing right now, that I'm measuring out right now. So let me, uh, I don't wanna lose track of things. Now this one, I'm not gonna get a short piece out of. So this one I'll get 21 out of. I'll get 21 out of this one, but this length on the end is too short. So I'm not gonna get another, another uh, long piece off of this one. <clears throat> So I need one edge for this one. I need th two more for this one, which means I'm gonna need 24 inches for those three boards. I don't know if I can get 20. I got 24 inches right here, which means I can get, let me try this one right here. Let me see this one. Let me look at this one, 20. Yeah, this one right here, um, I can get 24 inches, which means I can get three in boards out of this one. So we'll mark this one at 20, uh, 25 inches, 20, well, kerf, kerf. So I'm gonna mark it 24 and a half inches right there. And that gives me enough for like kerf cut off and everything else. But just, just so I can visualize when I look at my little marks here at, at how much um, I actually need to cut on these. Like I said, I'll go back and do the actual measurements once I'm, uh, ready to roll on these. But for now, it just lets me go back and quickly visualize if I just put quick marks on here. It lets me visualize um, the boards I need. So this is the one extra board I need for this. Is that what I said? Yeah, I need two boards for this one and one board for this one. And that is three boards, one, two, and three. So we're good. All right, I've got all those figured out. Now what do I got left here? Um, You know, I've got one long board and then two shorter boards. Uh, like I said, if I did a shorter base, uh, would be 18 and a half inches to get, yeah, I could do a shorter base on one of these. I could use these two for shorter bases. So 18 and a half inches and just make one without a compartment and that works. So let's do one here. What did I say? 18 and a half. So I'm going to go a little bit more than that. I'll just, Margaret 18 three quarters. And then, um, so I need two of those. Now these are not gonna have a storage compartment, so I only need two sides to these boards right here. And then this one is, because uh, let's see, 18, maybe 36, 37. Yeah, this is not 37. If this was more than 37 inches, oh, shoot. All right, let's roll back just a minute. This board, let me make sure this board is clean all the way through here. It is clean. All right, this board is 37 and a half inches. I would take a sliver off of each end just to square up the ends. I need 18 and a half for my boards. Oh, it's just not gonna make it with a curve cut. Ah. So I would need 37 inches of board for getting two 18 and a half inches of board. 18, 37 divided by two is 18 and a half. 
but I have to factor in an eighth of an inch for the kerf of my blade. So now you're talking eight, 37 and 5 eighths. Mm. No, 37 and no, 37 and an eighth. Yeah. So 37, ooh. It'll be close. It'll be close, but I can get it. I can get it on here. So 18, I'm just gonna mark 18 and a half on here. Let me just, let me just, let me just look. I know it's, I get excited over the weirdest things. But like I said, I, I like to really try to maximize my wood and get as much out of each piece as I can. Um, I mean, I could cut 24 inches out of here for three boards, but then I'm left with a piece that I can't use for anything. So yeah, the fact that if I can get, oh yeah, we're, we're golden here. We got this. All right, great. So this is gonna be a short, no storage compartment right here. That's awesome. And then all I need is, uh, to cut two short boards. I mean, one of these is gonna be sacrificed. I'm gonna lose about this much off of this one. Maybe let's see which one's worse. Probably this one. All right. Which means I need to cut two boards for this. I need two in pieces, eight and an eighth, which makes it 16 and a half, which means I go up to 17 just for giggles. Just by the time I do rough trimming and stuff. I mean, it's not gonna probably go to this, but it'll be close to it. Um, and I just kind of mark these out right there, just so I know what I'm looking at. All right, we've got the two that go with this. And that leaves me at the end of the day, if I need to, um, I, I might be able to do something with this. That's like nine inches of leftover wood. And then I also have an extra board here, which is nice because if I screw something up, at least I've got a long board to work with. And this board is 21 inches at least. Yeah, it's 26 inches long. So if I need to, whatever, if I botch something up, I've got at least one saved board here that I could maybe redo something with. But uh, anywho, uh, so now I think it's time to turn our attention to the miter saw, which is where I'm gonna do all of the cuts for these things. And let me go ahead and set the miter saw up here. So the miter saw, another very, very dust, I don't know who has an effective dust collection system for their miter saw. Um, this is kind of one of those reasons why I was talking about maybe building a, a miter saw station that goes all the way across the back that you can then build a shroud that comes over it to kind of capture all the rest of the dust. Uh, miter saws are just dust monsters. Um, I think the best one I've seen a review on, and from what everybody who reviews multiple different saws says, the Fest tool is probably one of the cleanest running ones. It has the best dust collection, but at, I don't know, 1500 bucks or something like that? Yeah, not gonna happen. Uh, so my Delta is a great saw, and I like the way it works, and I, I like the setup of it. Like I said, it's just the big problem with those things is dust collection. And I'm gonna set a camera up so that you all can get a better view of the, uh, of the saw over there. And watch that process happen. So pardon me while I fix a camera. I know you can't see it right now, but I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. think that'll work. I mean, uh, I know you can't see anyway, it doesn't matter to you, but I just want this to give you a, an angle so you can at least see what I'm doing over here. So I think that's it. Maybe I'll go a little bit wider. There we go. Okay. I will switch camera angles now for you so you can check that out. Let me, <coughs> excuse me. Let me just check my different feeds here, make sure nobody has any questions or anything. Comments, questions, nope, we're good. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting boards now. And looking at this. So now I can actually start looking at where I wanna really start making these clean cuts. 
and I'm going to take this board right here and I'm just going to trim the edge off because it's not clean. I'm going to trim the edge off and then I will measure this again and uh, get an exact measurement for eight and eighth and one eighth inches on that one. Let me grab my dust collection. Let me grab my ears and I need my, as always, I need my power to plug in over here. I will say that having to use one cord for most of my tools does make things a little safer because I have to really take time to move around and get things to where I want them. So did I just look at that one? This one right here, this one right here. Here's where we are. All right, let me make a, I'm just gonna shave the end of this off to get it, to get a nice square end there. And then we will do some measurements and start cutting these down. Um, actually, I'm going to do one thing right here. I don't know if you can see this or not, but I'm going to cover this computer. I actually keep a bag here when I'm running this thing. This computer runs my CNC machine, which is really great. I have a little keyboard, mouseless keyboard thing down here. And it does an awesome job, but it has a little tiny computer on the back of the screen. And in order to try to minimize dust and dirt, I put this lovely thing over it, which is just a trash bag, but <clears throat> it does keep it from getting completely dusty when I run this because this makes a lot of dust. All right, let's check camera. There we go. And let's do some cutting with this bad boy. All right, so that gave me a, uh, a really nice, clean 90 degree edge right there. And now I can measure eight and one eighth inches, which is how long I need this piece of wood to be. So that's eight and one eighth. And I will, so that I know which line I'm supposed to be drawing on because I drew all over these, I will make a mark on here to differentiate this from the other lines. I'm just gonna put a little arrow on there. It says that one. Now you can see that I have the line I just roughly made. This is my actual new cut line. And I put a little, a little arrow pointing to it so that I know that this is the one I wanna use now. So let's go back over here and get that lined up on the saw. Gotta grab my ears. This is also a very loud tool, so I highly advise using ears on this. Um, the, the, the biggest problem I found with doing this is you have to remember to cut on the correct side of the line that you've drawn. So always look at the piece of wood that you're saving, and then you know you won't accidentally, if you cut on the wrong side, you're gonna end up about an eighth of an inch too short. So just make sure you're cutting on the correct side of the line that you want to be uh, cutting on. And I don't have one of those fancy laser things, but I do bring my saw blade down and I touch that right on the line. And it's usually, I find it to be pretty accurate. I don't think I need one of those laser things, so. Okay, so this is my first piece that I've cut right here. You can see that one. That's eight and an eighth. Let me just uh, verify that I did this correctly. So eight and one eighth, exactly eight and one eighth, which is awesome. Now, what I like to do, instead of going back and measuring eight and an eighth inches and then cutting it again, I mean, you can be off variable thicknesses because of pencil, lead, and things like that. So what I like to do is use the piece I just cut as my setup for the next piece I'm gonna cut because it's the exact same length. 
So I clean the little fuzzes off the edge so they don't interfere with anything. And then what I will do is I will find that I, I get them exactly lined up. And I can tell you that your fingers are more sensitive than anything else you could straight edge or anything else. So when I line up, I get these two edges right here. I get these flush lined up and I just use my finger to slide this top one back and forth until this is as flush as it can be. And it's, it's like, feels like one piece of wood. <sighs> then what I will do once I get that flush is I take this board and I just hold it and I will slide this up to, I bring the saw down. I don't turn the saw on. I just bring the saw down to just above the piece of wood and I slide this until it touches those teeth. Then I pull it back. Now I can hold it and make a cut and that will be the exact same size as this one. So let me turn the fan on. You just have to make sure you don't shift after you get it lined up. All right, and that, my friends, bring it over here. That is two pieces that are essentially the exact same size now. And uh, yeah, awesome. Now I'm gonna do one thing real quick. I'm gonna try to keep these grouped together. So I'm gonna cut these boards right here, I think. I've got enough room over there. I'm gonna cut this one down to size. This is my 18 and a half inch. And I think I'm going to cut this one down right now um, just so I can get this kind of set aside as one project. So let me get these cut. Let me verify. Uh, first, I'm going to cut this edge. Then I'll come back and measure for my 18 and a half inches. So let me do that really quick. And keeping my stock pieces um, just because, like I said, I have leftovers and I might need them, so keep them handy. I'm going to put this up against the fence and just, just nick off the edge of this thing so I get it nice and square. That looks good. I probably need a new blade for that. I have not changed the blade on that since I bought it. That's the original blade that came with it. And I probably could stand to get a new one. 120, 130 bucks for a Ridge carbide blade. But it would be so worth it. All right, this is going to be 18 and one half inches. And I'm just gonna measure. So that's 18 and a half right there, that mark. I'm going to need another 18 and a half on this end. Just making sure that I've got that. And I do. So, yep, 18 and a half inches. Just double check that again. All right, let's go ahead and get this squared up. And then we will cut our two boards. But you see what I mean? I have to cut one end off to get a nice, super clean edge. This is Sorry, you're, you can't see what I'm doing. This is super clean right here now. Um, even though that blade probably needs to be refreshed, it's still a very clean cross cut. And that's the, that's the edge I wanna measure from, not the edge that was there before, because I didn't know if the other edge was, was 90 degrees to this long edge. Uh, you know, it was a little rough. So I, I just didn't wanna take a chance. Um, the other thing I didn't just do is mark which one. <laughs> I don't wanna cut, I've got two lines really close to each other. This is my cut line. All right, now I know which one is my cut line. Grab my ears and let's go cut this board down. See, the other problem with having, um, let me get on that correct camera. So the other problem I have with my uh, saw being where it's located, I mean, it's on wheels, which is nice. I can kind of move it around, but you can see I've got a door right here and so 
If it's cold out, I can't really raise the door. If it's not cold, I can raise the door and have really long pieces of wood right there. If it's cold, I have to leave the door down, which means I kind of have to move everything around to make a cut. So, <coughs> like I said, if I had a miter station where it was much further down the line, you know, one day, one day we'll look at that and say, yes, it's going to happen. All right, make sure that, <sighs> make sure all the material is clear out of my fence because I want this to be right against the fence. Now, I do have a stop, so if I wanted to secure this down, I could put this stop in here. I could get this exactly lined up um, where I would need it to be. And then I could actually take this and secure it. Make sure it's flush. There we go. And then I can secure this down to the base. And then this piece, it won't, it won't shift or move now. So if I get it positioned, I can use this to do that. Um, I, I use it about half the time. Um, Usually if I have longer pieces and they're unstable and they're a little tippy, I'll use it then. Uh, for smaller pieces, I tend to go without that. So, all right. Hopefully you also notice that when I make a cut, I always take my hand off while the blade is all the way down inside of here, and then I'll raise it up after it's stopped. Um, even though there's a shroud that comes over it, I just find it's good practice just to let this blade stop turning before you lift that back up. Um, the only thing I, the only issue I have with this is the placement of the, the trigger on this because it's right on top here. And I wish it was like a thumb thing that I had to push. That would make it easier to not accidentally grab this, like if I'm pulling this down to accidentally kick that on. That would be my only change I would make to this saw. Otherwise, it's a great saw. Um, one of the reasons I went to this saw, I had a smaller saw and it wasn't horrible. It was just a smaller saw and it had a smaller cutting capacity. This one has a much larger cutting capacity. So if I unlock this, you can see that I can actually come way out here and cut much wider boards. And that was my thing is I needed to cross cut wide boards and I was always having to pull out my circular saw and a guide and clamp it on because I didn't have the capacity on my cross cut. This gives me about 12, maybe even more uh, inches of cross cut capacity. So it's one of the reasons I really like it. That, and if you look at the mechanism, I don't have to have this thing pulled way far out from the wall. A lot of these things that are sliding miter saws have bars that run back. So you have to have space behind the saw for those bars to extend back because you're pulling it. This has these little robot arms and they're pretty awesome. So you don't need any additional space behind the saw, which makes it really nice. Let me lock this back in place. All right, we cut this board. It looks really nice. I'm going to just double check my measurement on it really quick. We are at 18 and a half inches on the button. Now I will use this board to set up my cut for this board. And same method, I get it flushed up right against one piece against the other so that it feels like one solid thick board. And now I can just move this out of the way, bring this saw down, touch the blade. So I'm touching it, I'm just sliding it right against those teeth. I'm not pressing hard, just touching it against the teeth. And I set the blade down all the way into the wood and not turning it on, just set it down. That holds it in place. I can move this out of the way. And then now I can finish my cut. It's in the exact same spot it needs to be. So let me move this out of the way, turn my dust on, and we'll make this cut. I also have a tendency to hold my breath when I cut <laughs> so I don't inhale all that stuff and then after a second it sucks it all up into the into the dust collection and settles. All right, let's go back and look at all this stuff. This is now two 18 and a half inch pieces and two eight and one eighth inch pieces, which makes this a complete set of wood 
for one base, obviously it's gonna need a bottom and such, but that's plywood and I don't worry about that. The, this is the hard part right here is getting this lined up. So this is one base right here. <coughs> Excuse me. And we can go forward now in getting, um, cutting up these other ones, which are gonna be the longer pieces. Let me just uh, check here. Everybody's good. I just like to check, make sure there's no comments. I don't wanna leave everybody hanging out there if anybody's saying anything and I'm not addressing it, so. But I think we're good. All right, get that out of the way. Now we can start addressing some of these other ones here. This one is a long one and another one that will be a long one. And then additionally on the end of these are two short ones. And this is gonna be three short ones. So let me start with the two long ones and get those cut and then we can um, get set up and cut all of the short ones for at least these bases uh, right at once. So let me uh, cut the ends of these off to get nice square edges and then we'll come back and do some measurements and get ready for these. All right, let's set this one aside for the moment. <sighs> Clean out all the dust from my fence. Whoops. Come back to my camera over here, grab my ears. So, you know, this is one where I typically would say, you know, it's a good idea to, um, if I'm trying to measure for a cut, it's a good idea to use that hold down because you can see it's too long to stay on there by itself. But because I'm just trimming the edge off right now, I'm not really concerned with that. Let me uh, turn the air on here. All right, got these, and I need to measure 21 inches for this. So we'll come back here and measure 21 inches. Wow, all right. Well, that was a pretty good guesstimate because, dang, this line that I already marked on here is exactly 21 inches. That's, that's impressive. I don't ever do that. Um, measure that again, just for giggles. 21, and I need to be, what's my measurements on here? 21, okay. So, uh, 21 inches, and then this one as well, 21 inches, and then I'll have a couple of eight inch pieces left over, or they will be eight inch pieces, or eight and an eighth inch left over when I'm done. Let's go ahead and cut these down. Once again, rest this out of the way. Now, I've got, this is where I've got an issue. You can see I'm kind of, I need to cut here and I need about another inch. So I'm going to flip this around, cut it this way. Not the most opportune thing for me, but you do what you need to do when you live in a small shop. And I think right there is going to be my kerf line. That works. All right, so let me show you something real quick. Here's a quick little tip for you. I'm gonna to try to show you. I missed my line by a 32nd of an inch. I mean, I don't even know if you can see that. It's really, really close right there. Um, but I missed that line just a tiny bit on the edge here. So the fastest way I found to try to trim that off, this is my little trick. If you come into your blade, if you close, you basically take your piece of wood, put it back in place, pull your saw all the way down. Your teeth on your blade are actually thicker than the surface of the blade. So the surface of the blade right here is not as 
is it's not as wide as the teeth. The teeth are wider. If you close this all the way down and you run this board till it touches the actual flat part of the blade, when you and then you hold, you have to hold it in place because the blade will kind of kick out of the way as it comes back up. But it's going to move that board over just enough so that it's just a little further in than the teeth of the blade, and you can take just that little edge off. So push it into the blade, lift up. Make another cut, and now I'm perfect on my line. So there's a little tip for you. If you just need to nibble just a hair off, don't try to line up the teeth. Just run it right into the, the flat part of the blade, pull the blade up, and then cut it again. And, and you will take like a 30 second of an inch off of your board. And that is really, really helpful. All right, we are exactly 21. I will use this to set up this board right here for length. Now this is my one of my eight inch pieces, so I'm gonna keep this as an, that's gonna be one of my eight inch pieces. We're gonna take these, I'm going to take the edge that I cut here, so these are both cut edges now, and they're nice and clean and flat. I'm gonna get them so it feels like one piece of wood on the side here, and then I will move this back out of the way, and then I'm going to Slide this till it just touches the teeth. Right there, and hold that in place. And now we're in good shape to make a cut. Yeah. Kind of forgot my dust collection there, didn't I? Kind of. That stinks. I hate it when I do that. Uh, that. It would be really great if I could have things running on a circuit where when I turn the saw on, it turns on my dust. Um, and there are systems that do that. There's little boxes you can plug into when it senses electrical current, it turns on another device like dust collection. Problem is if I did that, it would blow my circuit because I don't have, I've got too many things running off the same circuit, so. I can't have one of those. That would be sweet though, because then I wouldn't have to always remember to turn the dust collection on. Like then. <sighs> okay, just make sure that I have nothing going on here. Okay, always nice to check and see. I mean, I get little updates and such, so. No updates in my Facebook. You all are either not here or very quiet, so that's all right. Except for my, uh, my brother-in-law, Mike, which was really nice to see him on the stream. Okay, now I'm gonna start cutting. This piece right here gets cut, I've got it marked, so this is gonna get cut into three pieces of uh, eight and an eighth inch. And then the remainder of those two pieces are also gonna be cut into eight and one eighth inches. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, I'll tell you what, let me bring one of those over. This is my, that's done. I'm gonna bring one of those over here, measure it to exactly the width that I need, and then I will use that as the basis of doing my, uh, my other cuts. Um, real quick, I just noticed this. Um, remember I was talking about the, the, the cuts of milling up the wood from the sawmill, and you can see that this one right here, so when, when I made this cut, this is mostly flat sawn wood right here. And you can see the grain on it, it's got that cathedral pattern you can see on the end here. This one is mostly what we would call rift sawn, which is angled, or almost quarter sawn, which is almost straight up and down. And you can see that the grain on this one is much flatter and straighter than this one. So there you go. That's the difference in how you mill up wood from a sawmill and how you get different looks out of the same type of wood by either getting straight grain from rift or uh, quarter sawing or this cathedral grain from doing the flat sawing. So before I cut these ends off, I thought I would show you that. All right, I'm gonna measure one of these. Um, actually, I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna measure one of these at eight and one eighth inches. Exactly, this, this end has already been cut by the saw, so I know that this end is the one I wanna work from when I'm doing my measurement, as opposed to this end, which has not been cut. So I wanna measure from this end. I'm gonna do eight and an eighth inches right here. And then I will 
strike a line. And like I said, I, I love this woodpecker uh, 851. I think it's like eight inches by five inches by one inch wide or something like that. But anyway, that's their 851. It is a, a fantastic level. Um, or not a level, but a square. All right, eight and eighth inches. I'm just gonna measure this one more time. Yep. And then I will use this as a setup piece for all of my other pieces that need to be milled. Uh, I'm gonna have to cut the end of this one off but this one already has a clean end, so I can do this one as well. All right, let's switch back over. Let's cut some more wood, shall we? Because, I mean, come on, it's a wood shop. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to cut wood in the wood shop. All right, now I am going to turn my air back on. I'm just going to leave it on this time and uh, as I move through these cuts, so bear with me. It did not turn out the way I wanted it to. I, I'm not sure why, but that one did not turn out the way I wanted it to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna remeasure on this one. I'm not sure what happened there. Uh, I might take this one since this was a leftover. Um, this one turned out just I, I don't know, just didn't get lined up right. Let me get this one right here, eight and an eighth. I measured it, I had it lined up, but for whatever reason, it was just off by a sixteenth of an inch, which doesn't sound like a lot, but trust me, I've made enough of these bases to know that I do not need it a sixteenth of an inch. If I use that as a setup block for all my others, um, they're all gonna be a sixteenth off, and now I'm an eighth of an inch off, and then that screws up my other measurements and stuff, so yeah. Let's try this again. Uh, I will redo that board out of this one right here. I think there's enough. Yeah, this is fine. So I'll use this one. Let me cut this one. I'm not sure why that happened, but going right to the edge here. Okay, let's do this one more time here. All right. Good. Egg off here. Really? Go up here, Sean.
Okay. So I got a lot more of those small ones here. For this one right here, this is 21 inches. All right. Yep. So this needs three boards. So there's one, two, and three for this. So this one now has all the wood necessary. And I have two here. These two boards right here are also going to be 21 inches. I can get one board out of this and then have these two extra. So let me cut the, uh, the 21 inch sections out of these. Uh, which one do I want to do first? I will do, let me do this one. Cut the edge off and then I'll uh, measure this one to 21. Okay, so if you saw me just quickly come back and measure this again, um, what happened was this, there's a little chip out of the edge of this board right here, but it stopped about, I don't know, three quarters of an inch in. I just wanted to measure, and so if I cut it off here to get rid of that little bad piece, would I still have enough to do 21? And I do. So it was worth uh, taking the time to measure that because that's just one little wood defect I don't have to work around. I can now just get a straight 21 inches out of here. So let's go ahead and measure the 21 inches out here. And this is not gonna have enough wood left over for anything. So this will not be any project. Well, I mean, this is just scrap. I use this for testing, drilling things, making holes, backing for other pro boards, for other things. Um, I try to use my scrap as much as possible. The end of the day, there's still, you know, there's a lot that earns up in the burn box. And uh, it's it makes me sad, but it's just the way it is. You know, you can't use it all. But doggone it, I'm gonna try.
Dios. All right, so I uh, quickly came back and grabbed one of my existing eight inch, eight and a half, eighth inch boards to uh, use as a reference for cutting this last board. And uh, this, I'm just knocking the fuzz off. There's some of it. It's, there's a little uh, fuzz from the saw blade and it can sometimes splinter you. So, all right, so there's three boards for that. Um, one, two, three for the short pieces, my two long pieces. So that is another base set up for making. So now I've got three that are all cut up, ready for the next step. And then I've got these crazy pieces over here. Um, what time is it? I have no idea what time it is. It is 1.15. Crazy long stream today. Uh, but this is just what I do. I just kind of you know, making these projects, it just kind of, once I get started, it just makes sense to keep rolling through. I believe these were going to be long ones at 21 inches. And I think I do, yes, yeah, so short ones on here and short ones on here. All right, let me, uh, let me get a 21 inch one done and I can cut the other one to size. So I'm going to cut this one. I'm going to cut off the extra right here. So you can see it's got a little it here so I need to cut this straight and then I can do a measurement. Okay, even, uh, even though I'm trying to do similar cuts, you can still see it. I mean, it takes time to do these things. They're not, they're not quick knockouts. Um, even though I'm doing a lot of the same cuts, it still takes quite a bit of time to get all the, mo the wood cut, um, which is why I try to be as economical with my time as possible and doing these things. All right, that's off a little bit, that's okay. All right, let me get the 21 inch cut. Actually, you know what? Let me grab this one and then I'll cut this little section off and that way once I get that one cut, I can use it and measure this one. <coughs> Work a little smarter, just a little smarter. Let's give it a try, who knows what'll happen if we try to be smart. All right, we're going to cut this right there. Looks good.
ones. Wait. All right, let's measure some more eights here. I think we're gonna get a couple of eight inches out of this one. And a, uh, eight inches out of, yeah, and some out of that one as well. So eight and an eighth. Eight and one eighth. Um, chameleon self like this is a great, I don't know where I got this from, but this is a great, uh, I find this really nice. It's, I like it because it stays out when you pull it and then it pops back when you hit the button instead of having to pull it out and lock the button. So um, those are my preferred types of tape measures. I don't like the one where you have to pull it out and then lock it. So I don't know what your preference is, but that's mine. Like I said, I don't know where I got this one from. It's called a uh, Chameleon, K-O-M-E-L-O-N, or Kemalon or Ivis. I don't know. All I know is I like it. It works well.
All right, let's see what we've got here. I think we're, uh, I only got three boards left over there, so I'm not sure what, <laughs> what I've got. Um, I've got three pieces that I can use for this 21 inch set. So there's another set right here. Um, and I like to group them like this so that I always kind of keep track of the number of boards I have to make sure I've got the right pieces to go with them. And I've got three more here. I don't think I mark any of these. So uh, let me see how long. I think this was going to be one regular board, in which case I've got an extra board. I mean, it just works out that way. When I started milling those other ones, I think I came up with some extra wood. So I'm, I'm not really upset about that. Um, it's always nice to have a little extra just in case you need it. Um, I need 18 and a half inches for a standard, which I've got one standard. I guess I'm going to make two standard size bases now, or no. 21 and one, two. Oh, these are 21s. Okay, these are 21s. I can do uh, one more long base. So, one, two, and then cut an eight inch out of that one. All right, well, let's do another long base. We'll have uh, one, two, three, that'll be four long bases, one short, short base. Um, for a total of one, two, three, four, five bases at, uh, you know, so that's, I don't know, when I'm all said and done, 600-ish dollars, probably a little more than that, um, 650, somewhere in there. Um, so, you know, cutting up from scrap wood from another project, and I'm going to get about $650 worth of bases out of that, and that is hard to complain about. For sure. I have to cut the end of this one off and then I will come over and measure 21 inches on this one. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm really going to try to cut down on the word, use of the word so. I, I do I do say that a lot. I, I, I hear it in my head after I've done it. I'm like, oh God, I did it again. I know it's not really that big a deal sometimes. And I've watched other people. I'm like, well, I'm not the only one who does that. But it's just one of my little personal pet peeves of my own, you know. It's one of those things that bothers me when I go back and listen to myself. I'm like, oh my God, can you say that word one more time, please? <sighs> All right, let's cut. That is, that is one clean edge. And just give it a little swipe with the sandpaper just to make sure I don't pick up any unneeded splinters. Not that there's ever any needed splinters. I don't think anybody ever needs a splinter. I definitely don't need any more splinters. I probably have some that are permanently embedded in my hand for sure. I've probably got some that are never coming out of my hand. All right, 21 inches. And we will, uh, I'm gonna take this board over as well. I'll clean up an edge and then match this one. But I think we're gonna be good. Yeah, uh, let me get this lined up, get my cut line on here. And I like to put my pencil lead on my mark and then slide the square up to the pencil lead. Try not to push the pencil lead out of the way. There we go. And just trying to get my most accurate mark I can. All righty, let's cut these. Let's do this. Let me bring this one over here so I don't have to chase it. Come on over. All right.
Okay. Believe it or not, that is done. I have my three pieces here. Oh, I have my three pieces here, my two long pieces. And uh, oh, I'm gonna take these ears off my head because it gets a little old after a while. All right, uh, I think we are about done for today. <laughs> At least on your end, I might do a little bit more. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask you all, if you're watching, um, uh, kind of an opinion thing. I have my own opinion on this, but uh, what is your opinion on sapwood? Do you know what sapwood is? Let me show you so you get an idea. So if you look at this piece of wood right here, the this is a uniform color in here and it's all dark. Typically on wood, um, the sapwood is more along the outsides of the, uh, of the boards. The darker wood will be more towards the middle of the tree as it grows. Uh, the sap is kind of carried along the outside rings and is usually a lighter color. So on something like cherry right here, you'll get this line coming through here and it doesn't extend all the way through and it's hard to see it on the end, but on the face of the wood, you can really see it. It's very prominent where you get this much lighter piece of wood and this darker piece of wood right here. And this is referred to as sapwood. Um, if you're doing, and you can see there's actually, even though this is a darker piece, you can see that there's a little sapwood in the corner of this one right here. Um, a lot of people try to avoid the sapwood when they're making stuff, um, especially if they're doing something like a walnut where they really want a nice uniform color. And I get that. If you want a nice uniform color, um, it does make sense. I, especially in cherry, am a fan of sapwood. So, um, did I lose you? Uh-oh. I wonder if I lost my feed here. No, looks like we're okay. Um, I'm a fan of sapwood. Maybe I did lose it. I think I lost my, my YouTube feed. Anyway, I'm almost done anyway. I'm a fan of the sapwood. I like the coloration. I like the way it, it looks. And uh, I'm just a, a fan. I think it looks really pretty. Some people don't like it. So anyway, you know, if, let me know what your preference is if you have one. If not, well, fine. And uh, that being said, I have all of my pieces for today. I am good to go. I think we are, um, we did a lot of work today. Got a lot of stuff done. I've got five bases ready to roll, and then I can start on the next steps of these, and they have different steps to them. And uh, there's quite a few steps involved, and it's, it's a box, but there's a lot of steps involved to it, and I'll, I'll go through those as we make these together. So have a great rest of your Wednesday. I will see you all back here again on Friday. Don't forget, social links and everything are down below. If, you, if you're watching, if you want to follow, if you want to follow my page or subscribe on YouTube or, you know, hit the bells and all those good things, whatever. I'd appreciate it. Not necessary. Anyway, I'm done. I'm out. See you Friday. Have a great afternoon.